Welcome everyone. So um, I'm going to be very brief. I'm just um, going to introduce our um, speakers for the opening remarks of the workshop. And um, I think uh, they're both very well known, so I'll just say briefly that uh, uh, Janet Gyatso is um, the Hershey Chair of Buddhist Studies at Harvard Divinity School and also an Associate Dean. Um, and Curtis Schaefer, uh, I don't have your chair down. But he's chair and it's right here. <laughs> he's got his chair right where he needs it. Um, and at the uh, University of Virginia. And <clears throat> thinking about uh, how we want to open this, as Holly said, um, both of our interests was really in, in, in some sense, trying to focus our discussions of theory and practice around this kind of shared goal of, of thinking um, in a more kind of literary, compelling mode. Uh, and uh, Curtis and Janet really came to mind as examples of great um, models and mentors of people in our field who have been so committed to thinking about cultural history and, um, and literature um, from a humanities perspective, you know, so from a really broad perspective. I remember one of the first times I met Curtis was at a conference at the Rubin Museum and we stayed late after an event talking about novels and he just said, you know, we need to read more novels. Right? We, we, we all need to be reading widely, you know, if we're thinking about how to bring this, uh, these texts that are so meaningful to us in the Tibetan into English, even if it's, you know, only excerpts here and there in a, in a bigger project that's not a full translation, but just to really think about what it, you know, how does style work, or how does form work, and can we do this better, and, and reading widely is part of that. Um, and I think Janet also just being really um, deeply, deeply committed uh, in all of her in all of her academic work, in her teaching, in her mentoring, to um, to asking questions that are relevant to the humanities broadly, as uh, as equally relevant right, to Tibetan studies and Buddhist studies. So, um, for that reason, we asked them to offer some opening remarks this evening. So, I just want to ask you to join me in welcoming them. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Thanks for being here. What an awesome event. Hmm? Can I start by asking you a question? <laughs> Let me start by telling a story. No, no. <laughs> okay. yeah, for, I'm going to ask her a question, but first I'm going to tell a story, and that's, uh, I'm probably going to bungle the dates, but um, uh, uh, in about 2008, um, Andy and I, Andy Quintman and I, uh, felt that there was a need for more venues to talk about um, Tibetan Buddhist texts as literature than we had in our normal academic venues. Um, as a side note, I'll, I'll finish the story, but as a side note, I can see that the same sorts of conversations were happening in different institutions, in, uh, in, in Dharma centers and translation groups. Um, and what we've seen over the past five years, especially through the work of Sadra, is that coming together that's, that's been so fruitful, I think. Um, so this was 2008. 2008, Andy and I put on a um, workshop on biography, a panel on biography at the American, um, at the Association for Asian Studies. That was the 10th anniversary of Janet's book, As Apparitions of the Self, which came out in 98. I hope I got that right. I think I got that right, yeah. We can both remember that, yeah? Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and the reason for that was simple. It's, it's one of the books that was a part of our um, uh, upbringing our education that really took seriously the fact that um, form and style have an impact on uh, thought, philosophy, devotion, um, that kind of embodied engagement with the literature. And so that was a really important book and it was, a, it was something that percolated for a decade uh, into um, uh, what became a workshop uh, in 98, we didn't really think of it as a workshop, but then, or excuse me, 2008, and we started to think of those as workshops over the last decade, and we've been really fortunate to be, be able to go to a bunch of different institutions, uh, both academic and non-academic. Uh, the last one was at Latse Library, um, which was a really wonderful yeah. event. Um, so now to the question, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit, Janet. This is not planned, but okay, yeah, none yeah. of this is planned. Yeah, we had a lot of notes, yeah. So, you were thinking in terms that many of us are thinking now, throughout the 90s, um, and I just want to know if you can tell us something about what started that 
process that ended up in apparitions of the self. Well, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to tell that. <laughs> okay, good. See, that wasn't um, so hard, was it? <laughs> Uh, but before I do, I just okay. want to say one thing maybe to contextualize what we're doing mm -hmm. in terms of translation. The conference being about translation, we're really, really focusing tonight on Tibetan literature as literature, so the category of literature. And so that's like stepping back a little bit from the question of translation, it's more you know, be, before you can be a good translator, you need to be a good reader. You need to be a good appreciator. So I think what we're talking about most of all is learning, first of all, how to be a reader. There's other technical questions that come up when you start to translate that, that are connected to that. But I, I just wanted to put that into context. For me, uh, and, and this, I'm glad you asked that question because it's, it's really what I wanted to say first mm -hmm. anyway. Um, when I had the encounter with the uh, secret Namtars of Jigmed Lingpa, actually happened a very long time ago. Gosh, I don't know when it, that was. Um, I'll, I'll think of the date la later, but it was way before the 90s. Mm. It was actually at a conference of Tibetologists of my older generation in Berkeley, and Stephen Goodman, who had written his doctoral dissertation mm -hmm. on Jigme Lingpa's Songbom, basically, talked about the whole, or, or, I'm sorry, not on the Songbom, on the Longchen Yingtik. And he talked about the whole Long, Longchen Yingtik, and part of what he did is he gave a short presentation from out of the secret Namtar of Jigme Lingpa, which is part of the Longchen Yingtik, and he read a couple of pages from it. And I remember very well uh, being really, really struck and blown away by that text. I said, wow, that's so beautiful. It's so amazing. It's so funny. I've never, you know, read anything like that in Tibetan literature thus far. And I then talked to him later about, um, you know, are you going to translate this text or what? are you going to work on it? And we sort of had a complicated discussion. He thought, he, he was of the impression that that was too secret of a text to translate, but I went around, and I, so he said he wasn't planning to translate it, and mm. I went around and asked about 20 different lamas, everybody who I knew in the world at the time, was is it okay to translate? They all said it was fine. Mm. And so I had the great gift of being able to translate what I later realized was like a really great work of Tibetan literature. But my point in telling this is that the first moment of it was just a complete knee-jerk sort of reaction of joy and pleasure in, in, in really being attracted to this literature, which maybe hadn't happened to me before in quite that way. And, and when I was working on this text and, and all the you know, issues of translating a quite difficult text. And some of the kind of strange things that it sometimes says, for example, he talks so much about himself. There's a lot of self-referentiality, and I was thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, the Buddhism's about no self. Why are you talking about yourself all the time? And, you know, there's so much self in here, and I actually started counting the, 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 the number of times that the term rang, like, shows, shows up in mm -hmm. particular. But then I, I actually just, you know, I had no idea that there was like this thing called literature. I, I know I came into all of Tibetan studies like not really knowing anything. I came out of doctoral program in which we learned no theory about anything other than Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, but nothing from the West. So I, but I just sort of realized, oh my God, you know why that, that this text is not only saying something, but it's actually using certain devices to that the way in which it's saying something is very beautiful and ironic and there's so another thing going on than the doctrine that it's trying to convey. And, and I, I just only realized that just out of getting my, you know, my sort of hands wet or what, what is it, my, my, my feet wet mm -hmm. in, in, this, in this text. You were on the ground. I was like the person with the ele elephant, like the, like the blind, like feeling around uh -huh. and going, Oh, this is literature, <laughs> and and then and, and then I said, oh, we know, seriously, like seri seriously, yeah. and and mm -hmm. and you know, and I said, okay, duh, you know, maybe we can talk about Tibet, you know, Buddhist texts as literature, 
So not only about its content, and, and I don't, I, I, I want to take issue with the idea that it's like, thinking about it as literature is that which, that, I mean, it, that it's that which enhances the, the meaning. It, it does do that, but I think it's not only that. It's so when you start to look at a text as, as literature, you're not only looking at the meaning itself at all, that the style, the elegance, the, all of these other dimensions have a life of their own that might not actually even be about the so-called meaning as such. And, and the, that's one of the things I saw happening in, in that work. So we can talk more about that as we go on, but that's my answer. So we were making notes for this. <laughs> and I'm gonna try and not put this over. Right. Um, and I said something like, um, uh, poetry is the place where you have to confront form as meaning. And I thought, wow, what a great thing to say. I'm going to have a lot to say about that. And then she puts in big red letters right after that note. This is on Google Docs. So not really. <laughs> so, not really. Yeah? Right? I mean, I thought I was trying to say something like, um, it's not about reference to some meaning that's it distinct from It can be. It, it is, but it's not necessarily. And one shouldn't think that the primary thing is necessarily me meaning. Mm -hmm. It, one has to, I, and I'm going to show some examples in a while where I think you're going to see a case in which the form takes off on its own and goes in a totally different, an unexpected direction. Hmm. You know, and of course, meaning does come in in the end, but it, it's it's not as though you know. So, so the question is whether which which tail is wag is 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 the mm -hmm. tail wagging the dog or is the dog wagging its tail? And is, you know, which comes first? Chicken and egg kind, kind of thing. So, you know, our privileging of meaning over form and style and literary mm -hmm. surface can be a problem. So just to at least put a question mark next to that. Yeah. I, 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 didn't, I did cross it out in red, but um, <laughs> it's true. that was yeah. probably going too far. And you can hear it, right? This is one of the great things about working with Janet is she is, she's from Philly, so that, that <laughs> And she can say things like, I take issue, or no. <laughs> right? Which in the humanities world is a kind of a nasty word, don't you think? What? No. No? <laughs> it's a beautiful word. <laughs> Very simple. Very clear. Okay. What I was trying to say, though, is that maybe I said form as meaning, but I think I meant form is meaning. In, in, in that when you read a no. poem... Okay. <laughs> there you go. Let me finish my thought. When you read a poem, that... The, it, the experience is all the meaning that you need at times, the act of reading. It's not that you're trying to get to something else. It's okay. that you're doing that. You're doing yeah. what? You're reading. Okay. Yeah. And, the, and especially in poetry, I would say especially through rhythm, right? It's, that, it's an embodied experience if you say it or if you, if you, even if you mentally say it. Right? You're inhabiting a rhythm that, that is there on the printed text, right? in, the, in the printed word. It's not referring to some external idea. True. Mm -hmm. So what is, that's a very good example. What does rhythm have to do with meaning? What does it have to do with meaning? Yeah. How does the rhythm, what, what no. impact does rhythm have on meaning? That's a good question. Okay. Nothing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I push too far what meaning means then. Yeah. Maybe I want to say that it's meaningful. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, which I, I guess is a different thing. Hmm? Oh, how is rhythm meaningful? Yeah. It feels. Feels good. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. More and more, that's pretty much all I want from a piece yeah. of writing. <laughs> 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 I, and I, I, I was... Yeah, the novels are too long now. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I remember reading... Um, um, I, I dip in to Wollstone's translation of the, of the uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, um, not because I want to make a study of it, but because um, he made an honest and at, at times extremely successful effort at creating something that's beautiful just to take in, right? just to be with for a second. And you only need a couple verses for that. Right? You don't need much else. Right? Um, maybe you could say that comes only with a bunch of other experiences that make that moment um, 
um, meaningful, that make it feel right. Mm-hmm. But maybe, maybe not, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so but get in more into that experience um, of Chikmi Lingba's text way back in the day, right? I mean, can you, re, can you, can you, can you reconstruct what, what got you there, right? What really pulled you, what grabbed you? Okay, so I can give a mm-hmm. theoretical thing on mm-hmm. this a little bit. Yeah. That um, there's a great theorist of li- literature, and mm-hmm. I like, this is something that really struck me a long time ago, and mm-hmm. it made me really understand something. So Jigme Lingpo is an example of someone who does mm-hmm. this. So when you're talking about the literary sort of level of the text, so, and rhythm is a great example, because rhythm um, refers to itself. The only way you know you have rhythm is, 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 is you, if you have a number of beats in a line. Da, 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 da. The only reason why you know you have rhythm is because the one line is parallel to the other, right? So it's, refer- it's referring to itself. That self-referentiality, which is what Jigme Lingpa is talking about all the time, and he's using the Dzogchen mm-hmm. terminology about it, self-referentiality is parallel to our being in our bodies in a way that's very primal. It's that enjoyment and that mm. pleasure that you're talking about. Mm. And so when you have that level, when, when that dimension of a text, it's, it's not always really obvious, so it takes a great writer to really bring that out. When that, when that is really brought out, you are feeling the person at, who was Jigme Lingpa, the writer, the author, as much as you're feeling what he's talking about. Because it's that level, that self-referential, it's like his body is coming through the text itself. And so that's, that, that's what was so exciting about mm. it, is I felt like I was re- meeting a real person mm-hmm. in the text. I mean, there's many different ways that he man- manages it, and right. I'd have mm-hmm. to go back and look at yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. you know, uh, many, many different levels at which he ma- manages it. Right? That's one of the beauties of literature, to be able to pull something like that off. Right? That's right. Because it's an, it's an imaginative act in, right. that, he, that he gives you, in a way, right? But well, also makes, he makes it possible, a, a writing like that, a writer like that, a writing like that. That's right. Makes that possible. I think he, it, 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 pulls, it it's pulls at the Im- embodied nature, so he embodies mm-hmm. the meaning. So it brings the body into the whole picture. And so, therefore, you don't just have a sterile meaning kind of out there, but you also have the body and the person and the emotions and all of those things as well. And you may not be aware of it when you're, when you're reading good literature, but it's something that happens. Anyway, this is what we were trying to do in this ongoing AAR uh, uh, meeting. A number of people who were part of that are here, and we struggled through the first of all the question what is Tibetan literature is everything that's written literature how do we know what's good literature and what isn't which I think I personally feel is still a really interesting task is you know to start to think about Tibetan literature in terms of you know not necessarily is saying the most profound philosophy necessarily, but what is the Tibetan literature that's actually literature in its own right? And what are the great classics from that perspective? We only really scratched the surface, and it was, I think, that last meeting that we had at IATS, I'm I'm sorry, at Latte, Mm. um, was only because we had been meeting for so many times, and so many people in the group were kept expressing skepticism of like, you know, what do you mean by lit- literature? We're not trained, none of us are trained to look at literature as literature per se. We're trained to look at it for its meaning, for what it's saying. We're not really trained to appreciate it in this kind of pleasurable way that, that, you, that yeah. you were talking. Mm-hmm. And I, I still think we're, we're only beginning to get there yeah. now. Uh, I, I actually, I don't think we're there no, as no, no. a field. Yeah. I think there's so many things out there in Tibetan literature, just in terms of style and all kinds of stuff that we've 
that we barely can talk about the categories of what's there so far. So if you look at if you look at a different field, you see a totally different trajectory. Look at Chinese studies, right? And there's a niche for everything, right? And it's very easy to say, it's very easy to find uh, Chinese literary studies where they talk about these things all the time and the, uh, the, the, an operative definition of, of literature is not up for grabs, huh? So in a way, we're never gonna catch up, but maybe we shouldn't even think about catching up because we're in a different space um, since we have these weird academic programs that don't really fit um, well the range of cultures and peoples and literatures and histories that we are involved with. Um, and then we have such a vibrant international community of um, people in traditions, um, uh, people in institutions all over China. Um, it's a totally different situation, I think, which we should, I've been trying to think about ways that we can actually embrace that difference because we're never going to be that big, right? Um, Tibetan studies. Um, um. But one thing that we have I think is so interesting that's kind of come up in a similar period um, is we have um, a, a, th a thriving, if small, tradition of, uh, I would say, largely secular Tibetan literary criticism. And I think this is really important for us to be learning about while we learn about um, uh, literature too. I go back again and again to a book I brought up um, last summer when we were here, uh, Don uh, uh history and f um, features of, of Gurlu, uh, uh, of um, poetic song. And that's a really, really wonderful book. In some ways kind of unequaled, I think. Um, and it, there's a history and then there's four basic features. Um, there's Lu Suk Gen Nyam, form, content, uh, fig, uh, 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 literary figure, and emotion. And I think that's a great starting point. It's not the end point for starting to think about what's meaningful in a given work of literature, but it's a great starting point. And if you take that uh, seriously, it gets you into the world of contemporary uh, Tibetan literary criticism too, um, which I think is both useful for um, uh, people like myself who weren't raised in that tradition and weren't raised reading these things, but also it's just a great geopolitical thing to do as well. Um, I don't know if that was an impactful book for you or what in kinds of Tibetan writers or thinkers you've been working with over the past years. Yeah. If you have anything to say about that. Well, uh, maybe we should turn to, I, I have a sort of a, a presentation okay. planned. Yeah. And looking at the watch. So we have two we, poems. We have one that's going to be more complicated and one that's going to be really simple. So, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. But this, this allows me uh -huh. to answer your question about okay, good. people that I'm working right with. On. I need the password here, Dominique. We're just going to put the screen down. So the presentation that I'm going to give is actually based on my collaboration with Pema Bum, who, as many of you know, is a Tibetan intellectual and scholar of literature. He works at Latse Library in New York. And, uh, and I would say, well, I would say everything that I have ever done in my work in Tibetan studies has in fact always been in close collaboration with some Tibetan teacher or other. And for me, part of the reason for that, amongst other things, is that working closely with a Tibetan who is a native reader who really has an appreciation of the literary level of a text is that you can sort of see the way they are reading the text and you can get a much richer understanding of the um, um, rhetoric of the text itself. So we, um, okay. That's good, I was scared by those. Yes. <laughs> Look familiar? <laughs> so I'm going to just talk to you briefly about a project that I got involved in having to do with Nyangak or Tibetan poetry, the kind of Tibetan poetry that is very deeply influenced by Indian poetics. 
And I'll say the reason I got involved in that, it's a long story, I won't bore you with it, but I, I never liked Nyangak at all. I always tried to get away from it. I like really in sort of the more indigenous Tibetan style. Nyangak seems very artificial and too complicated and too, I don't know, too sappy or whatever. But uh, I was involved with some other people who were working on the great literary classic from India, Dundon's Kavya Darsha or Nyangak Melong in Tibetan. A group of scholars who were working on this in all parts of Asia, and I had the idea that I could involve Pema Bum to help me be, do the Tibetan dimension of that. And as soon as I started working with Pema Bum, the whole thing got really interesting and fantastic. So what I'm going to present to you is based on everything I got from him, actually. Okay. So he, he's not here, but he must take credit for this. Uh, so, um, as I think many of you know, the Nyanga Melon was very, very influential on Tibetan literature. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, and these are coming from um, the work of the fifth Dalai Lama, who you see here, and uh, fifth Dalai Lama's dates 1617 to 1682, and Pekeba, who is an intellectual who, and scholar and poet who lived almost exactly the same years 1618 to 1685. Actually, he's a member of the Dalai Lama's court. He's a Kagyupa. So uh, it's not clear. Uh, we don't have a really good namtar for him, uh, uh, but it's, and it's not clear um, how well they, how, how often they were together. They seem to have been friends and known each other very well, but they also were sparring partners. So this is just to show you how these people used the technology that comes out of the Kavya Darsha, the Nyanga Melong, which is an Indian work, and how they changed it and used it for completely different, unanticipated uses in the mm -hmm. Tibetan context. And this is what I mean by literature, literary devices, changing what the meaning is going to be. So the literary devices leading the way. So Kavya Darsha is organized around these figures of speech, right, the gens. There's a whole bunch of them. In each case, it, to it it's tel tells you how you use language to refer elliptically or poetically to some topic in some kind of artful way. Uh, the Tibetans count about 300 such gens in the text. And for each one, actually in the original work itself, the author talks about the, um, the, the principle, and then he gives an example of a four-line verse which illustrates that particular device. Uh, in Tibet, what interestingly happened was that, you know, Nyanga Melon was so influential, and people started writing their own kind of exercise books in which they would go through every one of these gens and write their own example poem. When there's, there's this whole genre of Tibetan literature that I wasn't aware of at all until I started working with Pema Bum. It's amazingly, it's, it's so many examples of this genre and really fascinating because you have people just writing poems um, according to the structure of the um, Nyanga Mel. So here's example number one. Um, is that clear? And do I need to move for you to see? Oh, okay. Okay, so this is a um, example by the fifth Dalai Lama. And it is illustrating something that's called dismissal through remorse. It has to do with remorse, but it's also something that sort of throws something away uh, as a result of the remorse. Um, and uh, so I'll just read the English. If anybody wants to look later at the Tibetan, um, I'll be glad to show it to them. I don't think we have time to go over the Tibetan. So he writes, never had the experience and realization of the likes of Marpa or Mila. Didn't reach the level of Shong or Pang's mastery. Stuck without wealth or power on the peak of a mountain. The useless life of a man comes to an end. Okay, so he didn't, this guy didn't do anything he didn't have any experiences. He didn't reach. Shong and Pong are the, the two great old uh, Tibetan translators of the Nyanga Melons, so very knowledgeable in poetry. 
um, they, the guy didn't have any wealth or power, and the useless life of a man comes to an end, right? So that's the Dalai Lama's version of the verse. Here is the original one that Dundon wrote. I earned no money, gained no knowledge, did nothing for my soul. I lived a long life, but I wasted it all. Seems sort of similar, right? Uh, in both cases, they're saying, I didn't do this, nothing happened, everything. And the difference is, of course, that it's in the first person. Mm. However, the more you think about the Dalai Lama's verse, just go back to it, who's he talking about? Never had the experiences of Marpa and Miller didn't reach the level of stronger power. So he doesn't, doesn't have any meditative experience, doesn't know anything about poetry, doesn't have any wealth and power. Who's he talking about? The karma box. How do we know that? <laughs> uh, we know that because this is the way that this verse has been understood for a long time. So in fact, the fifth Dalai Lama and the Karma Kagyus were not the greatest of friends. One of the reasons might have had to do with that there was a big war in central Tibet in which the uh, Kargyupa uh, supported um, uh, lords of, of Tsang, fought with the fifth Dalai Lama, the fifth Dalai Lama won, his forces won, and that's what made him the king of all of Tibet. But even afterwards, even though he won the war, he wasn't terribly fond of the Kargyupas after that. And especially because the Kargyupas, in fact, have a very uh, strong tradition of poetics as well. And there was, what we start to see is that there's a real rivalry in Tibet on who has the most uh, kind of prestige in terms of literary capacity. So here again, you see a, a case where it's not only, uh, you know, what you're writing about, but, but who is the best writer? Who can use these gens in the most clever way as a way to get prestige simply from being a good writer, never mind what you're writing about. But what's really interesting is the Dalai Lama is using what for Dundon was a pretty innocuous example of just, it's, it's really only supposed to be talking about how it didn't, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, everything was really bad. In this case, the fifth Dalai Lama, is, he's not talking about himself. He's not stuck on top of the mountain. So he's using the first person, but he is not stuck on top of the mountain. He lives in, do you see that original slide? <laughs> he lives over there. And he's got a lot of power. So, oh, I wonder who are the people who are stuck on top? Those poor guys who all they do is meditate, trying to be like Marpa and Mila, didn't get there. Uh, but he doesn't, doesn't have to say it. All right, let me give you a couple of other examples real fast. Now that you're laughing, I know I made my point. Um, second one, uh, here's another example, I'll give you Dundon first. No real education, no heed to the wise, lack of self-control, man's sure, surest way to disaster. This is actually a similar kind of device where, but in this case it's the, um, a kind of causation where the absence of something causes something to happen. So in this case, the absence of education and doing anything good leads to dis disaster. All right, again, straightforward. Fifth Dalai Lama. Didn't sit in the row of Mahamudra meditators. Again, Mahamudra, who likes Mahamudra? Um, didn't foster the biographies of many great gurus. He's really meaning here, I, this is not such a great translation. He, I didn't write a lot of biographies of gurus didn't wrap this human life around mere sophistry, thereby did I achieve the level of Shang and Pang's mastery. This is a really interesting uh, verse. Again, it's first person. In this case, uh, we think that this is, he's referring to himself, actually. He, because, see, to get the mastery of Shang and Pang, that's a good thing. Karma buzz don't have it, I do. I, the Dal Dalai Lama, do. Shong, if, if you're like Shang and Pang, you're a great genius of li literature. But he says he got there not by virtue of meditating, 
not by virtue of writing uh, biographies of gurus. Actually, it's not true. He wrote biographies of gurus. He d I think the Dalai Lama did do some meditation. I don't know. This is a really interesting case where you see the Dalai Lama talking about something. It, it seems to be the case that uh, Buddhism is not really important here. By sophistry, he means logic and argumentation, which is so important in the, in the Galupa school. He's saying, I didn't do any of those things. I didn't meditate, I didn't write biographies, and I didn't learn Buddhist lo logic. What did you do? I became a poet. So this is, a, a, in, in, in this case, you know, the, the occasion of having to, to be able to use this literary device is an occasion for him to say something really honest, uh, perhaps. I mean, whether he reached the level of Shuang and Pang, that's for others to decide. He was actually a pretty good poet, as you can see. But he's using, again, this uh, exercise to learn poetry as an opportunity to toot, tout his own horn. You know, something that might be hard to do in other, other contexts. So again, the literary device, the literary learning these type of poetic ornaments enables all kinds of other things to happen. Okay, third example, and then I'll be done. Uh, this time, this is Pekeba. So Pekeba is the friend of the fifth Dalai Lama, and he has his own exercise book. And... Uh, Actually, I have two more. So th this is the, the, the same um, figure. This fallen era guide of beings, so the guide of beings during this fallen era, is in the full bloom of youth. He has mastered all of the teachings on the terminologies of convention, and without applying himself to inner yoga at all, has managed to hold the victorious teachings through explanation, debate, and com composition. In this case, it's almost saying something very similar to what the Dalai Lama said, but not exactly. He's ironically noting that, um, you know, Tenzin, this is the guy who holds the teachings. This is the Dalai Lama. How did he get there? He didn't do, you know, he's in his full bloom of youth. He knows all the terminologies of convention. That's like, again, logic and debate that the Galupas are so famous for. But he never did any med meditation. How ironic that this guy who never did any meditation is up there on the throne as the fifth Dalai Lama. This is him getting back at the Dalai Lama for critiquing the Kargyupa's you know, strength in meditative tradition and saying, hmm, I wonder how this happened. You know, he did all these other things, but hmm, he managed. You know, he's the great holder of the teachings, and he didn't even have to do any yo yoga. But he's actually saying, you know, how can that pos possibly be? He can't really be a holder of the teachings. Okay, so that's that one, and then here's the last one. Um, this is the uh, him, one other example, which is, this is terseness in um, expression, duja in, in Tibetan. This is also Pekeba. Who's he talking about? Without the taut shape of an eight-footed lion or Garuda, and unfortunately I couldn't get a, a picture of the eight-footed lion and Garuda. This is the six-footed one. It's got four feet and two wings. Couldn't find an eight-footed one. Okay, so he has the taut shape of an eight-footed lion or Garuda. He is forever paused, po posed haught haughtily in the monastery, look looking super awesome. <laughs> He performs his duties, but he's actually inanimate. Only a child's mind would find this wondrous. Who's he talking about? <laughs> the fifth Dalai Lama. So, uh, you know, here you see these kind of um, arrows, bullets flying in both directions in the kind of innocent guise of learning how to write literature and how to write poetics. But um, using it for their competition between them, it's, it's also quite funny. I mean, how serious they were, how angry they were at each other, it's not very clear. I don't know whether they all were laughing like, oh, gotcha, and then gotcha back, or this was considered to be a really serious, um, you know, kind of insult of the great fifth Dalai Lama. 
you know, he performs his duties, but he's actually inanimate. And one of the interesting things about this particular figure of speech is like, it's not, it's talking about this Garuda. It's not actually talking about a man, but it's, the implication is it's comparing someone to the Garuda. But this figure of speech is the one in which some of the attributes of the thing that's being compared are the same and some are not. But it's not clear exactly which ones are the same and which ones aren't. So there's a bit of ambiguity and it, you know, it allows someone to make a politically pretty outrageous statement um, and be able to get away from it, uh, get, get away with it because it's not very clear, in fact, uh, what he actually is saying. So that's, that's my examples of how literature, especially in the hands of the Tibetans who are pretty kind of mischievous in receiving the Kavya Darsha, but turning it to their own purposes, which goes far beyond what it seems supposedly to be about, um, really makes for some amusing and interesting reading. Now so we'll have the, another example. So they were frenemies at best. They're frenemies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. I, See, I've that was a great example of using yeah. literature. Because yeah. not only did you, yeah. were you, you saying that they're friends and enemies at the same time, but when you put the two words together, that well, made, made a slip. That was Dujo, yeah. Yeah, that's uh -huh. Dujo, yeah. Yeah, exactly. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, um, time's moving on, but uh, I mean, there's just so much rich here. And I think, aside from the technical aspects, which you just began to bring out for us, to me, what's so incredible about that is how human it is, right? They're, they're friendly to each other. They... You know, they express love, they express pettiness, they express hate. And they're llamas. Right? right? And they do all of these things through this medium, huh? It's part of what's incredible about poetry, I think, um, in, in pre-20th century literature. It's maybe the place where that humanity comes through the most. Autobiography, sure, but poetry, it's, it's quickened somehow, I think. Even in places where you think that there's that formalism rules the day, huh? It really doesn't, right? No. Right? By the 17th century, they had, they had naturalized this, and some were so adept at it that they could use it for very localized, very specific social and interpersonal Yeah. Um, right. Uh, Which have nothing activity. to do with ostensibly what the thing's actually about. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. So that's what I mean by it's operating in a different level. So that was a great example of what they read up in that northeastern city that Janet lives in. <laughs> Down in the south we read stuff that's simpler. Um, so I, probably a lot of you, if you read Gore at all, you probably love nature no, poetry. No, no, you probably going. love poetry that brings you places. Huh? It's probably one of the things that got you into, um, into reading Gore. And of course Mila is so wonderful for this. Um, I can remember the, f the exact place I was um, when I realized that I needed, that I was not imbibing enough poetry, and that was Reichenpuk. I don't know if any of you have been to Reichenpuk, the little spur between the um, Yarlung and the Chungay Valleys, which is where Tsanya Hiroka died, and it's just such a gorgeous place. Um, and, you know, of course, we bring all of these narratives to places like that, but for me, that place. Um, uh, gave back in so many ways I didn't really expect in terms of ongoing appreciation of, um, uh, of all kinds of writers. So just let me leave you with um, a poem from Shopkar, which does um, some of the things you, you, you alluded to. So let's see here um, if I got the first. Yeah, okay. Uh, some of you might know this poem. Um, I'll just read it in English. We can share the Tibetan later if you want. Um, lonely mountain hermitage through the summer into fall. Meadow flowers, many shades. Swarms of bees dwell, sounding sweet. Branches budding, lovely trees. Birds give voice, they fly and flow. Fountain pools, fragrant and cool. Quenching pangs for all who thirst. On the lakes and in the ponds float sweet-voiced and lovely geese. On these vast, these gentle fields, dear at ease, rose all, uh, roam all around. In this supreme and lonely place, so infinitely wonderful, on a gentle bluegrass seat. And there's one more line, but I want to pause there for a second. So this is in some ways a classic Shopkar nature poem. Um, it sets the stage 
Um, it evokes this wonderful world, uh, which is deeply visual and it's sensual too. You feel it. Um, if we were to work through the um, the uh, aesthetic emotions that he that that he's working with, and there's a, there's a there's a one of the I think it's a breakout panel on Rasa theory, um, on aesthetic theory, which I think uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the video of because my breakout panel is uh, during that time. So <laughs> I was really sad about that. I was actually thinking about jumping mine to go to that one. <laughs> um, anyway, I think it's probably following writers like Don Gao, it's probably fair to start to um, apply that kind of theory to works like this, just at least in a playful sense. And so, um, you know, I think he's probably using three of the eight that Don Gao lists. Maybe some uh, gekpa, some sensuousness, um, some meijung, some wondrousness. And, but then there's one more too. So let me read the last three lines I just read and then the very last line of the poem. In this supreme and lonely place so infinitely wonderful on a gentle bluegrass seat, at times I just lay down to sleep. And I, I read that one, I read this one probably getting on 20 years ago now, and, and I thought this is such a beautiful moment when it should be all about enlightenment and it's about the most human activity. Maybe it is about enlightenment, huh? Um, uh, but it's about the most human and gentle activity and I could just feel it, right? It's one of those moments when, when, when you're there with that writer, you're there with that writing. So maybe there's humor too, right? And then I started to think, well, maybe, maybe um, Meijun and, um, um, and Shege go together in a really powerful way, huh? Right? Maybe, hu maybe awe and the sublime and humor go together in a wonderful way. Um, and thinking back to um, our recent loss this week of Chris Stagg, um, you know, my read on Milarepa is that he's all about joy in the midst of samsara. Um, and well, that's one of the things that I think poetry does really well, is keeps us going along those lines. So. That's it for me.